Hello, it is I, Graham Norton, and I have big news. Unbelievably, we've come to the end of season two of the Graham Norton Book Club. Yep, 20 episodes just like that. And to mark this occasion, we're doing something big, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Normally, I am joined by uh, a wonderful guide through the world of books, either Sarah Collins or Alex Clark. But today, and surely this is a sign of an oncoming apocalypse, I am joined by both of them at the same time. Hello, Thanks both us. of you. Brace yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Double trouble. Um, but uh, do you know each other in real we've, life? We've yes, met, haven't we, do. we, Sarah, a few times. And I think we first met, we were doing an event and I think it was about Jane Eyre. Am I right? It was about Jane Eyre. It was a, a night with really sort of dark and stormy gothic style weather. And you were the most brilliant interviewer. It was at the British Library. The next step is actually to run away and co-host a podcast together, you know, Alex. Yes, I know. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I know. I would, but I'm kind <laughs> of ashamed. We can have Graham on as an occasional guest. <laughs> Uh, so listen, what normally happens on the podcast is uh, it's me and either Sarah or Alex, one of you, uh, we come together with four clubbers. We basically talk about the book of the week and we don't really talk about anything else. And at the end, we say goodbye. We don't know really how people felt during it, what they experienced during the podcast. So what we thought we'd do is we'd go around to the clubbers and ask them about moments that kind of stayed with them from the making of the podcast and then we can share our experiences or we can tell the clubbers they're stupid and they shouldn't have felt like that (laughs) (laughs) they're they're idiots uh so all right let's find out what made a big impression with our clubbers uh first up is gabby there was a moment when graham pointed out that i've chosen yet another book about dying and i really had not realized since then, I've looked at my bookshelf and been like, bloody hell. Um, it's, a, it's a lot. Other favourite moments have been Jean's rants about Venetian masks. I'm not sure anything will top that. Now, I remember those Venetian masks. I wasn't in on this. Tell all. It was actually a criticism of Zadie Smith, who one would think is infallible. But um, Jean spotted that she'd committed the sin of including, I think it was porcelain masks in a scene in On Beauty. Is that right, Graham? I didn't want to cross Jean, but I think think what J.D. was describing were those, you know, those Venetian masks that people hang on their wall, which are made of porcelain. But so that's what, how else would you describe that? But obviously that's not a mask you'd wear out of Venetian mask ball. (laughs) So I I just, I said, fine, Jean. Uh, But Gabby does seem very fond of death. I mean, but it's so weird that she chose like two death memoirs, one right after the other, (laughs) without without noticing. Oh, of course. Yes, you're absolutely right. They were both her choices and they really are quite sad. But I would say that most books are quite sad and have death in. So if you had a mind to think, oh, I've just, I mean, can we think of a book that isn't about death in some or other fundamental way? Yeah, I guess, I guess. Hey, should we find out what our new clubber, what impression we've made on our new clubber? Uh, this is Gerard. Sorry for the mask. I've got a cold, still getting over it. I don't want you to see my snotty face. I think it's the first episode. <laughs> where I was proper, proper nervous. I spent ages getting everything set up. I had cushions and pillows on the wall, making sure that it absorbs all that sound. Um, had my headphones, my nice expensive headphones. And I just went to quickly go to the loo. And I think I went to get a coffee at the same time. And I came back and I just sat right on my headphones, completely snapped them in half. <laughs> I, um, I spent ages trying to fix them with glue, but it did not fix my headphones. And I thought he was going to get run over by a double-decker bus. Yeah. That would be my Jeremy. memory. There was a lot of feeling in that. Like you feel like you really had been through it. I was <laughs> triggered by the mention of cushions and pillows on the wall because that's where I started. You know, it ensconced in my lavatory with with towels taped up everywhere. I can't believe they made you do it from the loo, Sarah. We didn't make her. She that was they, her chosen. That was her chosen room. It was all about soundproofing. The things I will do for this podcast. But I actually think Gerard's first episode was really, really good. You know, you'd never know that he'd had that horrific technical glitch moments before because he acquitted himself really admirably. 
Maybe it was the adrenaline. Maybe the adrenaline's good. My, my, I have had a lot of tech problems. We all have. It's not a very good thing about the human spirit, is it? Because basically you're so pleased if it's someone else. There's this tremendous, as long as it's someone else. And yes. I did, my favourite moment is being coached through a tech issue by one of our producers and them talking me through a particular thing you had to do and I couldn't work it out. So I just pretended I'd done it. And then our <laughs> producer said, did you really do that or are you just saying? And I had to say, I was just saying, I was just, saying I was just pretending. <laughs> what I like about the technical thing is 20 episodes in, None of us, none of the clubbers, none of us are any better at it. It always takes... <laughs> yes. <laughs> it takes longer, really, to get going than it does to record the podcast. That's what I find. My favourite technical glitch memory actually wasn't even my fault. It was the moment when my husband decided to turn the Euros 2020 final on downstairs <laughs> and somehow it was linked up to the bedroom speakers, which is where I'd graduated from the lab. <laughs> I can't believe anybody would arrange a podcast recording for the Euro final. I mean, that was a, well, that was I mean, a failure we, on the management. We didn't board. actually care very much about <laughs> no, it. We didn't even recognise the sound. We're like, what is that? Yeah, is that? vaguely sounds yeah. like football. <laughs> yeah. Uh, let's find out uh, about Margot's experience of being a part of the book club. If you've listened to some or all of the podcasts, you'll know that we had great fun recording them. Despite the subject matter in a lot of the books, the murders, the black slave trade, the sectarian violence in Northern Ireland, the indignities of getting old, we covered quite a range. Um, but two things have stayed with me. One is um, the last book that I read, Homegoing by Yagasi. And I'm just going to leave this with you. She was 20 when she started to research this book and she was 26 when it was published. And I just find it remarkable that somebody who is so young showed such a depth in her writing and such a compassion as well. And the other thing is a story that was recounted by Stuart Bain. All I'll say is that it's about a thrush in Orkney and that I really haven't laughed as much since the beginning of lockdown as I did when he told that story. Was that story was that story aired? I think it was behind the scenes. I was there. Alex, you missed it. This has to be the old time book club moment. Can you praise it or is it not suitable for mainstream Go, go, Graham. Basically, he started working for the RSPB. He started working for them as a PR, um, you know, because birds need uh, good press. And uh, he just started and his first week, this thrush showed up in um, Orkney that hadn't been there. Was it since 1982 or something? Something. Say, 1982. <laughs> and so... Um, uh, he was in the post office and they said to him, he was in the queue and he went to the lady behind the counter and he said, how are you? He said, oh, I'm so busy because uh, this thrush uh, has shown up for the first time since 1982. And the postman said, well, I wish I hadn't seen thrush since 1982. <laughs> <laughs> and the thing, the Orkney thing humor. about Stuart is that every single session there's a story like that. You know, Stuart mm. just has either has the most colourful life or he's able to describe his life in the most colourful ways. Wonder if maybe you sort of develop a kind of way of seeing the great fun in things if you live on a tiny island lashed with weather. Perhaps. Maybe it's that. Yes. Speaking and from also, Ireland, yeah. I think that's true, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> and talking, talking of Ireland, I must say, I'm regularly kind of amazed by Margaret. I think she's so open. I really like the way she reacts to books, that she doesn't, yes. she doesn't come to books with prejudice. She doesn't come to books with preconceived ideas. And I, I often find, she, you know, she's quite, she's one of our quieter clubbers. She doesn't say as much as the others. But what she does say, I always find really insightful and, and kind of heartwarming that, this, that books touch her in the way that they do. I really like it. I'm going to try to make a deep point. We get very um, convinced through social media, perhaps through politics too, that people are really entrenched in their positions, that they take up a position, that it's inflexible, that, it, that we can tell what it's going to be because they're in a kind of tribal sort of set. But it's just, this has just been discussion. People don't like things, do like things in a completely unexpected way. It's just been so interesting everyone's been so kind of open and against yeah. that sort of feeling that you have that people are in their little kind of constituencies of liking and not liking and will never change their mind it's just been lovely 
And speaking of people changing positions, I think one of my favourite memories ever of the podcast has to have been being introduced to the wonderful Mrs. Palfrey at the Claremont by Elizabeth Taylor, not the actress, the underrated writer, because (laughs) it is, as I said at the time, the kind of book I would never have picked up. And it's suffused with this kind of nostalgia for the British Empire. You know, I'm a person from the colonies and decidedly anti-colonialist. And yet it has it quickly became one of my favourite reads of all time. It was just so astute about character, so moving and so demonstrative of how reading bridges that gap, you know, this ageing protagonist, female English protagonist yearning for the days of empire and this sort of not ageing Caribbean (laughs) bookworm who completely fell in love with the character. Talking of ageing characters, uh, Jean, our oldest book clubber, uh, let's find out uh, what she's made of everybody. I think it's been a most wonderful thing and I've made real friends amongst the clubbers. But perhaps the highlight for me was when I presented Billy by Albert French as my book in series one. And we had a very good discussion at the end of which Graham said, and I've got some good news for you, Penguin's going to republish it and it's also going to become an audio book. And I was absolutely thrilled because having listened to the interview between Albert French and Graham, I was very conscious that Albert seemed rather low and as if he'd been disregarded for the whole of his life. And I hoped that this was going to give him a terrific Philip. Oh, I must say, I'm so with Jean. I loved that that was the happy ending of that story. I love that we managed to track down Albert French. That it was not easy to find him because he has totally given up. He has totally walked away from publishing. It was interesting, during the interview, you could feel him sort of waking up. You could feel him thawing out and realising, oh, yeah, I do still have a writer's brain. I do still have a storyteller's brain. It was the most book, the amazing book. episode, wasn't it? Because everyone was enthralled by that book. It shows, actually, that, that readers can resurrect writers. You know, that was such a wonderful little narrative arc there as well of him connecting to that feeling of being read again. And as you say, thawing out, what a wonderful way to put it. You know, that that connection between reader and writer is so important. And here we see it demonstrated kind of tangibly on the book club. It's one of my favourite things as well. And the clubbers getting to put their questions in these interviews with, you know, world famous authors. Um, and some of them really, really insightful questions too. Oh, yes, no, I mean, they put real work into the questions. Um, yeah, yeah. Unlike me. Uh, <laughs> uh, let's You're the mere conduit, Graham. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm like, what's your favourite colour? Uh, let's check in with uh, Saima. Now, the thing that I have absolutely loved about the book club, as well as listening to all the lovely authors, which has been a complete treat, has really been the complete and utter honesty with which we, as the book clubbers, have been able to talk about the books. So my best example of this is um, Exciting Times by Nisha Dolan, which I chose because I thought it was really funny. So here we had this book written by a young person about young people. And then when we came to discuss it, all the young people and most of the people on that podcast, apart from me, are really, are really young. Um, they all hated it. Um <laughs> And the people who really loved it were myself and Graham. It was the moment when I realised officially that I was actually now old. I remember that. It was all the it youngsters. It was extraordinary. It was almost as if they'd had a mirror held up to their lives and they didn't like it. <laughs> no, exactly that. They couldn't laugh at themselves. Whereas I think what's brilliant about Nisha Dolan is she can kind of satirise who she is while she's still yes. it. It's a real gift, yes. that, I think. And she is a genius. I mean, I, I think her your interview with her reminded me of your interview with Zadie, you know, that kind of quickness and agility in, in conversation. When I was talking to Denisha Dolan, I was really aware that she was sort of, um, it was like she was talking to a child. <laughs> I, I was aware that she could have, she could have been uh, giving a very different answer to all the questions, but she was, it was like, kind of like, I'll take it easy. I'll take it easy on her. Because she is so incredibly clever She's with so, so many clever. references and so, oh, I mean, it's the same with Zadie. You know, Zadie is so well yes. read and, and, you know, and like, 
I read, but I don't remember it. I don't retain it. I can't tell you, you know, well, as so-and-so said in such and such. Well, I do have to say, though, Graham, I've been really impressed with, I don't know if Alex um, shares this view, but anything I throw at you during the sort of top three, you have either read or have something really clever to say about it. So I'm not going to accept that you're not as well <laughs> well read as these others. He has been a bit snotty about some of the, the, the top <laughs> well, three. Well, yes, that he, he does like being snotty. It's true. I, <laughs> true i have this running thing where i'm waiting to see if he nods or you know squints or <laughs> and if you say something like now this is a little bit on the verge of speculative fiction oh you can see that you can see the <laughs> shoulders go down and you think oh, i'm gonna have to work really hard to make this sound sound good don't catch him when he's grumpy either you know because there, there are there are there are book clubs where he's grumpier than others <laughs> But also, having said how open all the clubbers are to all the different books, me, no. I, 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 come, I come with so many prejudices. <laughs> Not good. Shall we go to uh, Stuart? Let's find out what uh, Orkney resident Stuart thinks. My favourite moment from the Graham Norton Book Club comes from the final episode of Series 1, when we were doing the hellos and catch-ups before we started recording. Um, when we recorded the first episode of the series, I had just got married and there we were 10 weeks later and I revealed to everybody involved in the recording that my husband had left me that morning. I let that bombshell hang in there for a few seconds before revealing that my husband actually works at sea and um, he had just gone back to the ship as normal. The look of shock and horror on everyone's faces kept me laughing for a long time afterwards and I feel like I still need to apologise to everybody for doing that. It's quite a mean trick to play, so um, I'm sorry, everybody. Of course, when my husband works out that I am actually insufferable and leaves me for real, you'll all have the last laugh. I would probably give it about six months, to be honest. <laughs> I was I was reliving that then. No, I, I was, was like, there. what? Even secondhand, it makes you feel shock. <laughs> it was weird that we all just accepted it so quick. Like we all just went, oh, did he? <laughs> like, we, <laughs> there was no kind of like, how could someone leave you? How could how how could a man walk out on you? We were just like, oh, did he? Oh. Stuart is great, and actually, Stuart's another one who I think. Uh, you, we've, I think we've changed his reading pattern over 20 episodes. Yes. You know, he has picked up books he wouldn't pick up. Like, it was so weird to hear Stuart waxing lyrical about the House of the Spirits because that is, I just thought he's going to hate this book. I actually want to mention the House of the Spirits. I thought they are all going to hate this book. They're going to slate this book. I've been banging on episode after episode about how we shouldn't hate a book because we hate the characters. And there have been a few clubbers who have, you know, been going on and on about unlikable characters. Oh, I didn't like this one. I didn't like that one. Therefore, didn't like the book. Here we have the most hateable character of all the books we've ever covered. And they all loved it. It was, wasn't it our only book that scored perfect tens? And so for me, it was a plot twist because I just thought, there you go. It was our very final episode of yeah. series two. And the clubbers had demonstrated that they could actually love a book, even though it featured despicable characters. And my favourite thing was getting to interview Isabel Allende. I loved her. I just thought she's great. Really fantastic. Speaking of ageing really well, phenomenally well. Yes. Isn't she 80 and on book number 800 or something like that? And husband number 15. <laughs> Speaking of husbands and Stuart, though, on that final episode, Stuart's husband came back. So there was a bit of a narrative arc there as well, because I think his husband had, was returning the yeah. next day from his stint on the oil rig. God, that's so um, romantic. Having isn't left it? him on the first episode. Yes. The fact yeah. that we've got a clubber who lives in the Orkneys, whose husband is on an oil rig. It's like it's like a BBC drama. He's doing PR yes. for Thrush. I mean, it's, it's great. <laughs> uh, let's check in with uh, Katie and find out her impressions of the club. My top moment would have to be probably the first book I got to put forward, which was actually a graphic novel, The Sandman by Neil Gaiman, Preludes and Nocturnes. But um, I was just really like amazingly surprised and really pleasantly surprised that everyone gave it a go. Nobody turned their nose up about it because it was a, a comic. And also people who had never read a comic before, like Margot, was, were just like really open-minded and actually seemed to really enjoy it, which was great. And 
big nerd moment for me was getting to hear Neil Gaiman answer my questions as well. I was like, ah! so that was really exciting. Yeah, I was surprised everyone was so open to the Sandman. I mean, I think I was the one person who wasn't open to the Sandman. I remain an unconverted. <laughs> really? I cannot read and look at pictures at the same time. I've decided I'm not a multitasker. It t- completely <laughs> took me out of the story. I mean, I, ca- I came away from that thinking I should read more of the Sandman because it was only by the end of that first book in the Sandman series that I kind of, I, w- I was starting to get it. Um, but of course, I haven't picked up a single other one. So, yeah. yeah. Alex, you've never read a graphic novel, have you? I have. But I would <laughs> say I, I don't sort of, you know, I don't I don't rush to them in the bookshop. Yes. I can't, yes. I, you know, I, I have and I do, but I would not say, you know, that I'm a graphic novel enthusiast. But they, the devotees that they have, and I mean, particularly someone like Neil Gaiman, makes me think I've sort of got it wrong to a certain extent. Isn't it interesting? I, I think the three of us are far more fixed in our ways than the clubbers. I think that's what, what, yes. I'm, what I'm taking away from this is that we are hardened in, in our reading taste and aren't open to new experiences. Do I like the words the going in through my eyes? That's what I really like in life, generally. I like words pictures. in through my eyes. And pictures... I like on the wall, and that is terrible. Or on the I think that movie. could be a, a blurb for someone else, for someone's next graphic novel by Alex Clark. I like words going in through my eyes. I just do. Yes, I'm beginning to get the impression. Kate, this might be the only graphic novel that gets into the book club. I think Katie, Katie had beginner's luck. It won't, it won't happen again. Uh, finally, let's check in with our now a boat dweller again. He's had some issues. It's Shivan. So I tend to record the podcast at school uh, because I live on a houseboat and the, and the internet connection on the houseboat is, is just not reliable enough. Unfortunately, for episode four of this series, the internet completely cut as, as I was about to join the conversation to record uh, the podcast. So I ended up having to unplug all my electric equipment, tuck my laptop under my arm, run down the stairs, Put, literally push past the six formers who were making their way out uh, to, the, to grab lunch in the high street and sprint back home uh, to record. So if I sound slightly breathless uh, on episode four, it's because I've just made it through the door and I'm panicking about the fact that I'm about 20 minutes late uh, to the recording. I've had another meltdown uh, for episode nine. So you can tell I'm the most unreliable of the clubbers. Uh, for episode nine, my internet connection on the boat just didn't hold up it wasn't strong enough um it couldn't take the the uh, bandwidth that the podcast demanded so i ended up being kicked off uh the conversation well i thought i was kicked off the conversation uh but unbeknownst to me the recording was continuing so the other podcasters and the other clubbers uh, could only hear me frantically typing in my password and cursing uh, I, I i think several times under my breath um in sheer panic so Thankfully, I, I believe that was edited out of episode nine. That's the first time I've ever seen his face. Like, I mean, I I wouldn't recognise him walking down the street because he's normally <laughs> in some weird corner of the staff room with his head kind of like that. Yeah, <laughs> trying to find an internet connection. <laughs> Shivan is so kind of scrupulous in his arguments and so sort of eloquent and, and rational. I can't quite imagine him screaming and shouting and swearing and hair pulling out at all that must have been very difficult for him he seems a very controlled sensible person the boat makes no sense how did he end up on a boat i mean he he absolutely how did he end up on a boat well do we know i don't know i don't know i mean he's trying to sell it i think the sale fell through yes (laughs) Was it the House of Spirits episode where not only was he on the boat trying to find an internet connection, but he had to balance his laptop on a tower of pillows? <laughs> so he, he had to hold perfectly steady for the entire hour of our recording. We just hope there wasn't a swell on the canal. Yeah. <laughs> and I always think, what happens when he goes back to his classroom? Well, he must be the coolest teacher. I mean, wouldn't you have loved to have an English teacher who was recording the Grim Norton Book Club podcast in his spare time? I, I, he I must have cool podcasts. Points. He's very protective of his students. There have been a number of books he wouldn't like them to read. You know, he clearly is a very, very good teacher. I mean, it, it's, yes. yeah, how lucky are those students that he is their English teacher? 
he he has the English teacher's perspective as well, I think. You know, like you, you talk about sort of scrupulous, well-reasoned presentations. He does bring that English teacher's perspective. But I have been really blown away by how well-reasoned and engaging all of the clubbers are. And the fact that they're that they're prepared to slate the books that the other mm, clubbers have chosen. Absolutely. You know, they, they do not pull their punches. <laughs> no. I mean, they hated exciting times. I mean, poor Matt yes. Hague at his Midlight Library is now shut down. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so some books did not fare well. But even in even in something like the Midnight Library, I thought it was interesting that people were able to criticize it at the same time as acknowledging its popularity and that why people love it. We asked them, don't we, to say how likely would you be to recommend it? And it just opens up that question of if you were giving it to yeah. somebody else, well, it would depend who too, you know, it would depend to, to a like-minded friend, maybe not to somebody who wants this, you know, there are many, many different kinds of reader and every book doesn't have to be for everyone. Yeah. In fact, I wouldn't have given most of the clubbers the House of the Spirits and yet they, they <laughs> and it's all It's the one they would all give. <laughs> yeah. And that's the one they all loved. Uh, well, now you know a little more about what goes beyond, on behind the scenes. If we've whetted your appetite, if you want to hear more of us talking about books, you can. Just go to Amazon or Audible, search for the Graham Norton Book Club, and there's loads there. 20 episodes, as I said, and we talk about and interview authors from Margaret Atwood to Zadie Smith. That's my A to Z right there. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, we also talk to uh, famous voices who create talking books, and so much more. Uh, in the meantime, it just remains for me to say thank you very much to Alex Clark and Sarah Collins. And now we can, uh, we, because we've rehearsed this, all together, we will say goodbye. This is the part I always no, get No, you've already too. made it go wrong. <laughs> I've made it go wrong now, Sarah. Me, you and me together, always, I forget. And they go, you have to say goodbye too. I have to be cued. Now you say goodbye. No, do it once more with feeling. <laughs> Okay, we're going to try it. We've come to an end. And now we're going to the lovely viewers and listeners. We're going to say goodbye. goodbye. <laughs> <laughs>